right. Good day, everybody. We're back again. It's Atlanta Discussed. You know, in the past, I always say good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on what part of the globe you have. But my Australian friends say, just say, I did, just say good day. It covers for all. So today I say good day to people in all the seven continents of the world. We're talking Antarctica, Australia, Africa, Asia, Europe, North America, South America. Seven billion people, that's a lot. Today, we are still going back to the nation with the largest concentration of black people on the planet. That's Nigeria. There are statistics that show that one out of every four, you know, sub-Saharan African is a Nigerian. There are some that show that one out of every six black people in the whole world is a Nigerian. So that makes it very interesting. So today, we're looking at failure of leadership in Africa, Nigeria as a focal point. And today we have a very interesting guest, someone that's true to power, that slays stereotype, that crosses all barriers. And you know where she stands on all issues. Yeah, she stands. Her name is Aisha Yesufu. Aisha, welcome to Atlantic Discuss. Thank you so much for having me. It's my pleasure being here. All right. I know a lot of you know her, but I still have to introduce her, you know, in my own way, you know, because so that I have a better understanding of where we're going and what we're trying to do. Aisha is a change-driven and impact-like Nigerian social political reformer. There is no doubt about that. A civic and community development crusader, public speaker, educator, who consistently demand for good governance and fight for justice fairness and equity, and lends her voice in support of women's safety and empowerment. She is a businesswoman, which even makes it more fantastic here. You know, she earns her own money. She also teaches financial literacy to empower people to be financially independent and also has a voice to demand for good governance. Aisha Yusufu has spokenness and zeal to stand against injustice is innate and can be traced back to her childhood in Northern Nigeria. We are speaking up as a female, was unheard of. At the age of four, Asha was already standing up against injustice. Her father tells the story of how she went to him while in nursery school, demand to be the one to take her to school. As the neighbor who helped her to school was being hostile. I like that. <laughs> Asha, welcome to Atlanta Discuss. So basically so here, we're true to, yes, yes, we are true to power. We embrace all facets of humanity. We try and say it the way it is. That's just what we do. We search and discuss the fact wherever it leads. We talk IT, politics, faith-based issues. We just don't shy away from the fact. That's our credo. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, a lot of people think you're from the North, you know, and I mean, you're from Edo State, clearly, you know. So, I mean, you're Muslim and all that. So, I mean, I just want you to tell them, like, yeah, my name is Aisha, this is where I'm from. So, just for the record, because people don't know. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Aisha Yesufu. Uh, I am an active Nigerian citizen. I always tell people I'm not an activist. I'm an active Nigerian citizen. Uh, I'm from Edo State, born and brought up in Kano State. I grew up in the ghetto in a place called Kwenahudu. And uh, by the age of 12, all my friends were, 11, 12, all my friends were married off. I wanted education. By the time I got married at the age of 24, my my friends were actually grandmothers at that time. And so oh, wow. I, I, I grew up poor and uh, I would go to school in the morning without breakfast. Coming back, I wasn't expecting lunch. And uh, I, I saw how education, how important education was, and I, and I strived for it. And being poor, I realized that being poor, you were faceless, nameless, and voiceless. We are not even seen as a human being. Poverty strips you of everything. That's why I'm always very angry when I see, see people trying to romanticize poverty. There's nothing romantic about poverty. It is the most dehumanizing thing that you can think about where people, as a child, there were a lot of people who didn't want me to associate with their children because of the side of the town that I came uh, out from. So as a teenager, I was quite angry at the bad governors, at the corruption, at the things that were happening. And uh, I turned 40 and I realized that I also was the problem of Nigeria, my silence. And that was the day I decided uh, if God gives me the next 40 years that I was going to devote it to, to Nigeria. I devoted the first 40 years to myself. I had to work on my financial uh, independence and I was financially independent by that time. And four months after that, my declaration on my birthday was the abduction of Chibo girls. And I've been standing on national wow. issues since then. But my first protest was actually 1992. Interesting. So, I mean, from your... From what I've read about you, you are 50. So that means that yep. uh, as we grow up, 
you must have uh no, I mean you have always been active from H4 according to your profile. So that means you you were a bit uh, aware of what happened during Shagari, the mm -hmm. first Buari coming, Babangeda and all that. So why do you think Nigeria really got it wrong as a nation? Fundamentally, where do you think we got it wrong? Uh, I think uh, the first thing is the fact that uh, if, if I look at it back, let me look at it way before we were born, right? The, the nation yeah. is that we shouldn't be, we shouldn't have been together. The coupling mm -hmm. that the Europeans did were quite wrong. So they sort of like split people apart, depending on which nation controlled what. For example, in all honesty and in all fairness, the, the person, especially from the northwestern part of Nigeria, is closer to the person from Niger than they are to the person from the southeastern part of Nigeria or somebody from the south side like myself. And so, but you had some people who had the control at that time to own different, uh, uh, to take over different places, just split people up according to what was beneficial to them and not minding what they were doing. So that's the beginning of it. And then as as we went along, we were never able to define ourselves and find out who we are, who we are as a nation. Nigeria has not been a nation. So it's just a group of people who are together and people are keeping holding on to their either ethnic or tribal identity. And so this continued al along the way. And uh, we, we had the civil war. And for me, one of the one of the greatest injustice in Nigeria is the fact that we had no victor, no vanquish, forget about it, move on. No, you don't move on for such You're supposed to have a conversation. Why did this thing happen? So that we ensure it doesn't happen again. We learn from it. We keep the memories alive for us to continue to see never again. Let's not go this route again. But it was just pushed under the, uh, uh, the, the, the carpet. People were forced to swallow their pain. And this, and this pain never go away because you didn't have time to fully and functionally grieve, uh, over it. And then we came along, of, of course, uh, the military that we've had, uh, at They've just been uh, all over the all over the place. I remember when Sh Shagari was overthrown, and I think that was a few days after my uh, a few weeks after my birthday. The, uh, that was my should that be now my tenth birthday? Yes, he was over the thirty first of December. Uh, 1983. My 10th birthday was 12th right. of December 90. And there was jubilation on the streets because there was so much corruption. Even though today we look at them and romanticize those, uh, those politicians of that time, there was a lot of corruption. To the extent Nigeria was importing things like, uh, egg into the country, things like sand. Some people even, but they import sand to come and build, you know, has, there were a lot of things. I, as a 10 year old, I, I was very close with my father and we, we had a lot of discussion. We, we, argue, we will talk about things. So when he read, read newspaper, he make me read those newspapers. And so I was a bit aware uh, of the, what was happening in the country. So there was a bit of that jubilation. And then the whole Buhari thing, uh, a lot of high handedness, people being arrested, you know, law, just the way military is. And over time with the, the subsequent coup, counter coup, whatever going on, we got to 1999. And I think if I look at it from this end, where we really got it wrong, this current democracy that, that we have right now was in 1999. Unfortunately mm. for us, the people that died for the democracy of Nigeria, people died for the democracy of Nigeria, people fought for it. You know where we are mm. right now? We thought we, we were at a place in Nigeria where as Nigerians, we were afraid to even think inside our room because we thought mm. somebody would be hearing our thoughts. The fear of sure. Abacha was the beginning of everybody's wisdom. Some people didn't even want you to mention the name. And so mm. when he died, you know, there was jubilation all over all over the country. People were initially afraid and everything. And then Abdul Salam came over. And when he said he was going to hand over to civil uh to, to civilian to for democracy to start, people felt it, it wasn't gonna happen. And so most of those mm. people who really fought for the democracy of Nigeria did not participate in the in the election. So they didn't participate in that democracy. And remember something, nature abhors vacuum. So sure. if you don't do it, other people will do it. And then we had a lot bunch of criminals, people who, who were felons and everything. They came into the space. They entered the space. A lot of four one nights and what have you. And four years after when those Democrats decided they were coming to dislodge them, they couldn't dislodge them because they had put a lot of machinery. And that's what we have even up to today, the violence 
that we have in our election. And so it just, that's where we've been on it. That we've been spiraling downward since that time, unfortunately. Yeah, interesting. I mean, like here, Atlanta discuss also a discussion. So sometimes we have an opinion, but the, my next question to you is this. Nigeria is going to be 64 this year. I mean, I agree mm -hmm. to a very large extent that the British, the colonialists, did not put the right people at the right places and all that. But do you think it is fair for a 63 going 64 who will be a grandfather in so many climes? Is it fair to still blame part of our problem in colonialism? Absolutely and not. Absolutely, absolutely yeah. not. It, it, it's not fair. It's yeah, we look mm -hmm. at the historical context and say, okay, this is this is what has been done. But if after 60 something years, uh, we are still 64 years, we are still blaming uh the colonialists, mm -hmm. then we, we are as incompetent as incompetent uh, can be. And the, then that was the reason why they had to they, they even had to come and colonize us. The issue the I personally is think uh as Nigerians, we should be bold enough to sit down and say we want to have the Nigerian conversation. Nigeria mm. is uh the amalgamation of Nigeria is going, it's already 110 years mm. this year. And mm -hmm. 110 years ago, some people sat down and decided your fate. Why can't you sit down and also decide your fate? This is the time for us to sit down and ask and sit down and have a conversation, have a Nigerian conversation and say to ourselves, do we want to be together? Do we want to, uh, do we want to continue with this nation. I, for one, personally believe that one Nigeria is not sacrosanct. But good governance, mm -hmm. accountability, transparency, development, good quality, free education from primary to secondary school level, you know, employment and all of that, those, those things are sacrosanct. And if together we are unable to get it, then we need to begin to ask ourselves, how, should we now separate? Maybe we'll be able to get it. And if we want to, if we want to stay as a nation, how do we stay as a nation? We can't just continue with this because what we have is a few, there's a state capture. There have been a state capture in Nigeria uh, for, for, for years. So a few people continue to enjoy the largesse of the country and they've helped people that and they use that machinery of violence to keep to uh, perpetually keep the people, you know, subjugated. And that's what we are suffering uh, all of us today, and if if nothing is done about it, it's going. It's only going to worsen. Okay. So some of my past guests, I'm talking Professor Dinkalu, I'm sure you're familiar with uh, Professor Wakobia, Professor Patutomi, and Pastor Itwa. Now, these are some of the things they said based on this discussion we're having. Uh, Professor Wakobia feels that we can push the current National Assembly to legislate laws that will benefit everybody. Something I disagree with him over. Pastor Ito, I think we need a, a conference that will give a people's constitution. Uh, Professor Tommy and uh, Odin Kahlo have similar to They both think we need a political solution, even a political discussion, a political agreement as ethnic nationalities, even before the, the conference. So which do you think is the way forward? So you've said yes, you've said in your own words that we need to talk, yeah. that Nigeria as a country is not sacrosanct. But if we look at what Professor Tommy also said, he said it's failure of leadership. That if we have the requisite leaders, we may, people might not even be looking at all this area. Do you think if Epito Obi had been president, for example, today, Nigerians would be still thinking of secession, breakaway, and balkanization? What do you think? Well, it, well it's it's not about uh, the person, whether it's Peter Obi, mm -hmm. the president, today, it's about what will Peter Obi do. Mm -hmm. So if Peter Obi gets in there and does the same thing that all these other people are doing, people will, no, of course, ask for mm -hmm. them. But if he gets in there and he gives good governance, there's equity and justice, and everybody feels welcome to the country, which is what uh, part of the things that, uh, that, that he, he has said he's going to do. Definitely mm -hmm. people will not be thinking about, you know, leaving Nigeria. I mean, there are people who are buying passports of other countries. So it's not okay. about the geographical expression itself. It's not about the Nigeria itself. It's about the fact that in this country, there seem to be more, some citizens who are more citizens than other citizens. In this country, mm -hmm. there seem to be uh, some religion who, that are more important than other religions, even though Nigeria claims to be a secular state. In this country, uh, it seems to be that there are some gender that are more than other gender, even though we are supposed to be all human beings. And so these are the things that make people that make people angry, people agitated, and you can't have peace where you don't have uh, justice. Coming to some of the things that you've raised that the past guests have talked about, when you talk about the National Assembly, I always say something. You, nobody fixed anything that is not broken. As far mm -hmm. as those in the National Assembly are concerned, 
There's nothing broken. The, the present mm. arrangement we have is working for them. That's why they have, they, they can have a, 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 a corner, a large amount of money billions for themselves that are less than a thousand. Meanwhile, the rest of the people are sharing less than what they have. And so there's nothing, there's no incentive that is there for them to do the right thing. So, and they, yes, I do agree with the fact that polit politically it's also the way to go. And what we need to do, and that was what the 2023 election was all about, where people who hated to had never engaged in politics decided to engage in politics and change things. You know, that was a revolution, a bloodless revolution. The most important thing that needs to happen is that we need to begin to get people that we get into a legislative arm of government to be people with competence, character, capacity, people who are patriotic and will put Nigeria first and not their selfish interest. So when you have those kind, those kind of people in there, these are the kind of people that we give us the, 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 the laws that we require, the constitution that we are yearning for. When we are talking about this, uh, a conference, a confab, a this, a that, it's just, yeah, people come, we come together, we say all of these things, who are going to pass the law? It's only the, it's, it's only the legislative arm um, that, that have the authority and the power to pass a new constitution. Even if the president refused to give assent, they can veto and give and, and put it into law with their uh, two third uh, uh, numbers power. So what we, what we must also do is to look at how do we get people into the legislative arm of government? Who are the people who are vying for office? And of course, you know the issue of money. In Nigeria, money, money politics is everything. And so the people who have stolen our wealth, you know, our, our commonwealth, they continuously perpetuate themselves or their students in office and they control them. So we need to find a way where we, where we are ensuring, it not just participating in politics, but ensuring that the right thing is done. And that's why for me, as far as I'm concerned, 2023 uh, in Nigeria, there was a coup. It was a civilian coup. It was a political coup. It's no different from what happened uh, in Niger. People were even killed for this, our own civilian and political uh, coup, coup here, where the, the, the mandate of the people was taken away from, from them. And then the whole world sits down and there's this uh, uh, hypocrisy and double standard where they, they are hard on those who are being uh, military coup and then they work with those who are being civilian coup. That, 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 should, that shouldn't come. But at the end of the day, the citizens of this country need to sit up and decide uh, the kind of country that they want and go for it. Fantastic. I like I like that response, which puts me to the next question. Now, we're going back to the 2023 presidential election now. I mean, I, I spoke to uh, Ose Loka Obaze, who I'm sure you know. He, yeah. he was emphatic that the Labour Party won the election. I asked Absolutely. him, do you have empirical evidence? You know, and he gave mm -hmm. so many reasons when the IRF stopped working and all that. And they were it was quite convincing. Now, the way I'm putting it to you, my question to you is that, Based on Supreme Court verdicts and judgment that we've seen from everywhere. Now, talking to Professor Dikalu, he said in 1983, before the Buari coup, you know, the 83 election, the NPN then did a lot of rigging, that in Undo State, NPN was trying to manipulate Omar Boriowo to be governor ahead of Ajashi. And the Undo people stood firm. They were emphatic, they went to the streets and all that. That in Anambra State, the NPN was trying to pushing uh, CCR no ahead of an Uobudu. But the people of Anambra did not show any vigor or did not complain. So that in all note, the Supreme Court verdict favored what the people wanted. And in Anambra, well, it went other. So my question to you is, do you think when, for example, the IRS stopped working and a very spurious announcement was made by ANEC and all that, do you think the obedient and the Labour Party people should have protested? Do you think, with benefit of hindsight, do you think the approach should have been different? Because what? in Kano, they were in, mm -hmm. from what Odinkalo was saying, in Kano, they were scared of what the Kwan Kwan Sia people would do. That's why they gave the judgment to favor the people. So knowing mm -hmm. fully well that the judiciary probably just feared the people. So that's why I said with benefit of hindsight, do you think the approach should have been different? Well, uh, for me, I I I, I don't really know how to answer that question because in a way, okay. let me also give you another picture. Uh, to that uh, okay. question. A lot of people Please are like, ahead. okay, people should have been on the streets right from when the results, when even the uh, Mahmoud was uh, announcing the results, people should have been him and all of that. I've been on the streets enough to know that the, the Nigerian government is a terrorist government. 
and it kills its citizens with impunity without any care of anything. And to that extent where you said, oh, people should have been on the street. So some people say people should have been on the street while the results were being called out, shut down the whole country, go on this day. I can categorically also tell you that they were they, they were ready for that and they had prepared for that. They had all the tankers, military tankers all over at that place, mm. just like what they did in Ensas, where people were demonstrating peacefully. They brought in mayhem. They started a government uh, sponsored talk, started attacking people, burning places. And at the end of the day, up to today, they still gaslight it and said that it was Ensas uh, protesters that did that. Meanwhile, they weren't the ones that, that did that. So there's also what people should, there's also that possibility. They'll bring in the mayhem. They don't mind, they don't mind burning down one third of the country or half of the country just to get what they want. We saw what happened in River State where a whole uh, House of Assembly was burnt down because of some people, uh, you know, squabbling. So these are the kind of people mm -hmm. that we're dealing with. And by the time they start being that, you know, the next thing that people will say, eh, let's leave this matter. You know, people have already died. Let's move on. You know, it's 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 all of that. So that's that's another picture that I want people to also keep at the uh, at the back of their mind. And so saying that, let's go on and follow the ambit of the law all through the process has also shown something that the Supreme Court, that that the justice, the judiciary in Nigeria, it's not the last resort of the common man. It is a plaything of politicians. It is corrupt, and it depends on who is the highest bidder, and they are at the, at like the, the toys of politicians, and the politicians are rubbing it in. They are not hiding it. It's not just I say to say it. They are not hiding the father. The Supreme no, Court is on that their pocket. That's why we saw the fact that we had the gubernatorial uh, judgment that they did. All the governors were were thanking Tinubu, Mr. Tinubu, and telling him that he didn't interfere. And I expected the Supreme Court justices as they call themselves to be angry at such a thing because it clearly states that they are not independent. They are mere toys who are giving judgment. We saw in Kano where the judgment was different from the CTC, uh, the certified true copy that was given out. We, we've seen a lot of uh, different kind of judgments that are the conflicting ones, confusing ones that have been given by, 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 the, uh, by the judiciary. So for me, I think Going through that way, it also opened us up to how the rot is. Because people didn't understand the rot. It didn't start today anyway. Judicial capture didn't start today. It's been on, you know, all, all these years, right from uh, PDP time, even up to the, up to this time, uh, even before then. But people now have an understanding of how, of how it is. So whether people protest, and one thing I always say to people is that, look, there were always people that were protesting on the streets. Even during during throughout the uh, the, the uh, appeal court judgment, the tribunal throughout the presidential tribunal, Supreme Court, even while election, people were on the streets. Other pe people did not join them. And in terms of protests, you can't carry somebody from their houses. They are the ones that will go in and join when they want to. And if citizens join them, people are saying, oh, they were waiting for somebody to give them order. Some are saying they were waiting for Peter Obi. Why would Peter Obi be the one to give you that order? Mr. Peter Obi is not that kind of a person that would like say, oh, come and be on the streets for me. No, he's not that kind of a person. He will be the one that will say, okay, no, just stay on and let him go through the, the ambit of the law. And I think, uh, you know, we are getting to a place where we are saying that, you know, doing the right thing in Nigeria is almost like a crime. Because waiting for that judgment and uh, the judgment being there. But unfortunately, what we saw, the justices from the uh, appeal court itself and all the way to the Supreme Court, they acted more like ad, uh, advocates, not what's the word now, uh, they acted more like lawyers for the defendants rather than justices mm. that should be impartial. That's where we are in Nigeria today. Interesting. I mean, we both agree that the office of the citizen has been abdicated to a very large extent. I agree. I agree a lot on that. But right now, the judiciary, the legislature, obviously has been hijacked by the political class. I wouldn't even say the executive by the political class, you know. So the nation, as you know, it has always been weak. Now it's collapsing, you know. Now, do you think there's any hope? I mean, if citizens, for example, decide to be more active, how can they do that? Because our elections in the past have been free, but they never fair. Now they are not free, they are not fair. So wherein lies the hope? What does the future hold, in your opinion? Well, so the first thing I'm going to say, even uh, our, we've, never, we've not had free elections, really. I mean, there have always been intimidation uh, in terms of uh, election. There have always been situations whereby 
uh, people don't even vote, and then they can't result in 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 in, in Abuja. So the people okay. will still be at polling units. I mean, and people see they are calling it, and they are, they've not started voting, and they are announcing results uh, uh, in Abuja, the Maurice Iwo, and all of that uh, case before it then, with then, and even now. So we've not really had free fair election. But one of the things that I want us to always look at, that many of us never look at, is the fact that the first set of dictators that Nigerians came across is not their politicians, it's not their elected officials, it's actually their parents. It started from home. People are not allowed to That's have true. voices. As a mm. child, you're not allowed to have a voice. You're beaten because mm. you ask questions. You're beaten because you 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 made the man. You're be beaten because you point things out. You're told that, oh, a child cannot do this. Uh, you can't ask your parent to apologize. To you. I mean, literally, we have parents who don't, even up to today, who would not apologize to their uh, children when they've done when, when they've wronged them. So being voices being shut down. Those of us who were vocal, we were, we were called stubborn children. We got all the bits in our life. So people's voices being stifled did not start now. It started, that's the way they were conditioned. That's the way they were grouped. And that's the reason why up to today you find people who think because you make demand on government, then that means you're disrespectful. They will say, it's old enough to be your father. I'm like, I, well, nobody voted him to be a father. He was voted to be a uh, president. And if it's not doing oh, the right God. thing, it's yeah, you should get out of there, or if you, or your governor, or whatever. So that what now happened is that as this, as these Nigerians grew up, first of all, after their parents, they had teachers who also, you know, were dictators. Never allow them have a say. Some teachers will even punish you if you give them any information out of their notes. So they grew up as adults, and they simply replace their parents, teachers, and those adults are with government. And so they feel that you can't speak up to government. And don't forget also that Nigeria was militarized for a very long time. I mean, those of us we grew up, we know what it is to be flogged by military, to be told to swim inside uh, the pool of, which is not a pool, of course, which is gutter, full of dirty water. You know, there was no citizens. We just wake up and we hear decrees. We are the generation of uh, you wake up in the morning, 7 a.m., government tells you what they want to tell you, 9 p.m., they also tell you what they want to tell you. You don't have a voice to tell them anything, which is different from now. But one of the things that is very are very instructive is the fact that we now have a generation of children who don't even know that many people who are more vocal, True. whose parents, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. give them that room to 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 to, to make demands, even though it's not as much as it should be. And so they are actually making demands and they are really working on it. And the I and the, also the good thing about it is that they have information. Government used to control information. Now they don't. Mm -hmm. Social media has true. democratized media, according to Chu uh, Jido. Government mm -hmm. used to uh, uh, control every sources of you making money. Now they don't. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of Nigerians who are they making don't. money out of the Nigerian government. They can even keep currencies that government does not have control over. And so you have more people who have, even though as tough as things are now, more young people are able to make more money than we did during our own time. So that's giving them a bit of leverage. That's giving them a bit of voice. That's giving them, you know, with the social media, the world is like a global village. They see what's happening in other places. And so that's giving them a bit of voice, even though it's not enough. And uh, but I think one of the things that we really uh, get us to that place where we have a, a, the right critical amount of a number of people who are making demands, it's, it's the experience we are going through right now. The suffering, people are saying it by themselves because people, so people don't have empathy. It has to happen to them before they, they know what empathy they can relate. Agree, so it's actually, those things are actually happening right now. But I'll quickly end uh, on this here by saying that one of the biggest things that we also have to do as citizens is tough love. As long as we continue to be stopgap for the failure of government, people will not realize the relationship between governors and their lives. And so they will not realize that the, when you vote someone into office, it's not your food. You are not a fan. It's not your football club. That's somebody who is going to decide your life. So when people we vote anyhow, then they are coming to their fellow citizens to get money to pay their children's school fees. Oh, they are sick. They can't go to hospital. Their fellow citizens are crowdfunding for them. They are doing all of that and whatever. They won't have the sense to relate governance to their life. We must get to a place where we actually do tough love so people realize the relationship between governance and their lives. Wow, impressive. Uh, 
following all your work, most of the things you say, I've observed that you you even criticize Labour Party governors, Labour Party legislators. You don't you don't you're not partial, so to say, on your on your opinion. You 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 are just objective about it, which which I like very much, and a lot of people have said it. So nobody holds that against you. You're as constant as the Northern Star. So that's why I'm going to ask you this: What is different about Peter Gregory Obi compared to other Nigerian politicians? Because you are clearly an impartial, a non parochially minded person. You say it the way it is, you're educated, you're exposed. So what makes Peter Obi different? Empathy. In your opinion? Empathy. 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 Mm. He cares. And mm. he's someone who cares for the people, for the masses. And he always have that, I want what we work for people. I used to be at a point in life where I thought competence was the most important thing. Until I realized that you can have a very competent person, but a very wicked leader who doesn't care about the people, I wouldn't even mind. And so for me, that's empathy is something that, and his capacity to want to learn, and he loves being criticized. That's why myself and him, we've been able to work together. And in terms of, he doesn't shy away from you. I remember the first time he called me and he was talking to me about his candidacy. And I said to him, look, I'm not nice. If you expect that I'm going to come meet you and be calling you excellency, excellency, count me out. I said, I'm not nice. I will always, and he said, I want to hear the, the, the bad news. I want to hear what is wrong. I want to be Christian. And actually he has kept to that. That's the kind of person uh, he is. The second thing I said to him is that your back will be safe to, with me. If there's ever a day that I feel myself and yourself can't work together, I will let you know and you will know it. It's not the one that I'll be with you backstabbing because in the whole of poly, I've, this, Peter Obi is not the first time I was in the political uh, space. I was there in 2018 in the team of Dr. Obi as a Kwesile in a particular party. So I know how, you know, how rabid that whole space uh, 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 can be. And so with Peter Obi, he's always learning. He's always wanting to learn. And so that for me, it's, it's, it's what is most, imp uh, what is important. But like I said earlier, that empathy, that care for the people, I think for him, it's, it's, it's personal thing. How can people be suffering? in the midst of so many. And that's why, I, for me, I just felt like now when I see some of these Northern elders coming out to, to speak and I'm like, please, can you just shut up? You had someone who literally was telling you what he was going to do in every of the states. Peter Obi doesn't have the, how, how would I put it? The, uh, uh, is it the glee boy, you know, that we come and we'll be giving you all those English that we, no, he breaks things out to the basics. Like he's not the orator, he's not an orator that will come and then all of you are swaying. But when he speaks, he speaks to your heart. You see somebody speaking to you with sincerity. And so that's, and that's the thing that Nigerians have seen in him. And they see that sincerity of purpose to say that what we have today, this leadership is not rocket science. If you care for the people, you will make it work. But what we have are people who don't care for the people. All they care about is themselves. For example, he went around uh, in all the campaign through the Northern state, every particular state he gave them what they were good at, what they had, what he was going to uh, do for them. Not that he was going to be the one to do everything personally, but of course he was going to assemble uh, people that would do the right thing. And sometimes when people see us like with his team, we are going back and for sometimes we are arguing and people like, they were like, oh, but you know this. He was like, no, that's how he has always been. That, you know, it's not about, oh, he's one leader that is somewhere that people have to be bowing to. No, it's all about sitting down and working together. So uh, for me, that key something I would say is that empathy but he cares for Nigeria and the Nigerian people. Not necessarily that he cares to be uh, the president of this country. If we were to have a country that works, he, he probably wouldn't, wouldn't even bother because he says he's not desperate to be uh, pre uh, president of Nigeria, but he's desperate to see Nigeria works. And that's the most important thing. Meanwhile, what we have is that there are some people who are desperate to hold that office. So when they get in there, they are more focused on the paraphernalia, para paraphernalia of office rather than on the lives of the people. Interesting. So with the way things are going, I mean, clearly, Dove is not going anywhere. I mean, with what is going on in Nigeria, we all see that maybe a mistake has been made. A lot of people think that eventually it looks like an OB presidency might help or maybe somebody else. Now, there's a strong possibility that there could be realignment of forces in the future, maybe towards the 2017 election. I mean, if possible, maybe PDP 
change his name or reorganizes or something and they say okay people will be come or we're giving you this and all that will you follow him to the pdp and campaign again like you did in 2023 well, I didn't follow him to a, a Labour Party. I'm not a member party, of Labour okay. Party. Over yeah, Labour so Party, okay. Supporter. If for me, like I've been saying for the for so many years, it's always about the mm. candidate. If a mm. candidate is good, and I feel mm. this is the best amongst the candidates, irrespective of the party, I will support that mm. candidate. I might probably mm. not play as much role as I did with the mm. Labour Party because with the Labour mm. Party, so that that was a party that was that wasn't given any chance. And that mm. was a party where people didn't believe in the whole this thing. So I knew I had to play a greater role, let people understand that, look, we can do this. And we actually did it, if not for the rigging that happened. So probably if there's a bigger, more bigger platform, I might support on the sideline, like, oh, yeah, that, that's the candidate. But if you had everything on, then I, I don't have to waste uh, uh, my energy, you know, putting everything or on being there with him and as long as it's it's going to get in there. But one of the things also is for me to say that let's not get ahead of ourselves in a way. There is, you know, the, the way the APC APC is going and Tinibu's illegitimate government is going is that they want to impoverish the people so much that <laughs> when they now see 10 Naira, it will be like 10 million. So now that they, are, they will starve the people, may probably until the election, and that time they will begin to bring half half cup of rice might be gold. Who knows? <laughs> so those are the things also that we uh, that has to we also have to put at the back uh, of, of our heads, and to to also understand that, unfortunately for us, democracy, uh, democracy without education is a disaster. That's what I always mm. say. So you have someone who is a professor. Let's say he's a professor in political science. He has one vote. And you have someone who has never been to four walls of school, never had any kind of a, a education. He also has one vote. So that person's okay. one vote cancels the professor's own. And unfortunately for us, we have, I think, maybe I might be wrong. We might have more uneducated people than educated people. We have more, more illiterate people than or unlettered people than lettered people. So that's 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 a big major issue that we have there. So most of these uh, people don't understand what democracy is. They don't understand what governance is. They don't even know that government is supposed to do anything for them. They don't even know there is a government. Some people live in spaces that these politicians who get into office they call those spaces ungoverned spaces. But when it is time to vote, ballot boxes we go to these un ungoverned spaces and they will collect the votes and come and count them. So you have a, this whole number of people who don't even know there's government, who don't know what democracy is. As far as they are concerned, every four years they have opportunity of making some little money. Mm. And so though that's, that's vulnerability for us there. The other thing also is religion. Religion mm. is part of the biggest problem we have in Nigeria. Religion has been weaponized. And the religious rulers and the political rulers, they have a symbiotic relationship where the religious rulers need the political rulers to give bad governance so that they can sell cheap uh, miracles. That's why somebody will go to a church or a mosque or a shrine or whatever and carry their passports uh, looking for a blessing to get a visa. Meanwhile, there are other people in other countries that are working that don't need visas to go to that country. And then when you get the visa, you, the pastor will say, yes, it's the miracle that he did. The mother will say, it's the miracle that he did, and all of that. The, the, the political rulers, on the other hand, they need the uh, religious rulers to keep the people subdued and subjected so that there's no uprising against them. That's why you hear things like protest is haram mm. and tell you not to do anything. On the, Muslim, on the Islamic side, they will say to you, you know, no matter how much you suffer in this world, this world is a temporary place. Your, your, your enjoyment is supposed to be in heaven. So keep doing it. And that's why you have organizations like Hizbah who they, 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 they go all out doing all sorts of things just to make the people feel that, oh, we are doing this because of religion. It's because of shit. That's why they are making you suffer. Don't think this will protect your re religion, endure the suffering. His bar will go out of that place, burning alcohol, destroying people's business. But at the same time, the state government is collecting VAT from alcohol. What kind of hypocrisy is that? You can't do that. My people say, 
what you don't eat, you don't use your mouth to share it. The same way, the same is bad that we sit a poor person's child down and cut his hair and say that his hair is on Islamic. We watch the governor's daughter might have lavish party, everything, and they will do nothing. And when the Hizba leader is called, you say that, oh, he wasn't in town. But if it's just leaders, we say, uh, we, leaders, we say to their people, oh, your, your, your colleagues and whatever, we come to you for food, for this, for that. And so we've, we've gone in a place where it's been weaponized. And so that in its own is also a problem that we have to battle because for the fight for that Nigeria, Nigeria that is supposed to be a secular state, you find the influence of religion so important on, on issues where religion should be, should take a back, a back seat. Because at the end of the day, religion is personal. I'm a Muslim. Anytime, mm. any day I say to people, don't add anything to my Islam. I'm not a, uh, uh, how do they even call it? There's, there's one word they call it. I'm not a liberal Muslim. I'm not this. I'm just a Muslim and that's it. But it's personal. And what is the injunction upon me is not the injunction upon another, another person. So these are some of the things that we have to battle for us to be able to get that country that we're all looking for. Yeah, I agree. I agree with uh, the government and the religious people. I think they're working together. I, di I didn't see it that way before, but with the way things are going on now, and one of the reasons why I think so is that when uh, Israel and Hamas started their, you know, their fight, uh, Islamic leaders in Nigeria were speaking. They all came out speaking pro Hamas. The Christian leaders were speaking pro Israel. Now they are killing people at our backyard. Christians are dying every day. So there are statistics that show that they've killed more Christians in Nigeria than anywhere in the world. All the Nigerian Christian leaders are quiet. Now, yeah. Islamic leaders also, Muslims are dying. Muslims are killing Muslims also. Nobody is saying anything. So. I think it's it's so easy for anybody to agree with what you said. Now you you well known you you respect Peter Obi. If there's a Peter Obi presidency along the line, and he calls you Aisha, look, there's this ministry is very corrupt. That that you know we need somebody competent. Please, for the sake of the country, can you please go and handle that ministry or that portfolio? Will you will you will you accept? No, I wouldn't. No. I'll, I'll tell you categorically. I'm not going to work for. Uh, anybody. I'm not going to take any appointment. I can I can decide that to run for office and be elected. Mm. I can okay. I can decide if I get to a place where I feel I I, can, I want to be accountable to be people. I want to curtail my freedom because I love my freedom a lot. I can decide to mm. run for office, but be an appointee? No, absolutely not. But I can work with him in my own uh, non-appointee capacity. If he needs advice on certain things, if he needs me to be the uh, uh, eye on what is happening to him, people, I'll call him and say, ah, you are not doing well. You'll see what is happening. This is, this is, this is, that. I can do all of that. Anything that needs to be done in an unofficial capacity, definitely. But in any way that I'm going to be uh, a someone's appointee, no, absolutely. I've never worked in my life and I don't have any interest in working for anybody in my life. I do. I'm a businesswoman. I've been doing business since the year 2000. I'm that independent and I don't I don't want to work for anybody. All right, go ahead. Nigeria economically is a sorry state. I mean, it's spiraling out of, you know, in my own words, I, I, I always say Nigeria is battered almost beyond repairs. There was a mm -hmm. series we had a uh, weak state, collapsed state, failed state. Nigeria has a focal point and all that. So we had uh, Senator Sonny and uh, I think uh, Pastor Itua was also in that series. And they all think that, yes, it's not yet a failed state, but it's collapsed, collapsing clearly. Now, with the way things have gone at the last election, the president was sworn in and all that, with a lot of baggage, certificate scandal, identity issues, and what have you. Do you think that even if a Tinubu means well, that's uh, Balatinu, if it means well for Nigeria, do you think those issues of the poor election management, rigging, certificate scandal, identity issue, legitimacy issues, so to say, are what is slowing down? What is happening now? Do you think it affects it in, in any way? No, that's that's not what is slowing down. But for me, let me just on the issue. And Nigeria is a failed state. Let's not let's stop mm. here. I mean, yeah, life is short and brutish over there. What else do you want? There's state <laughs> capture. There's judicial capture, media capture, capture legislative, legislative capture. capture. You, nothing, nothing is happening. News are not, there's media blackout, things are not. So what, what else is remaining uh, mm. for Nigeria to be uh, a, a field state? On governed spaces, some uh, some places where only three local governments, uh, you know, are functional. Terrorists have taken over, they are mm -hmm. hosting their... 
that. So for me, Nigeria is a faith state. On the issue of uh, attainable, uh, it, it's it's not the baggage, the the legitimacy issue that is holding him. It's the competence issue. Is the uh, attitude issue. Is the political will issue. Tinubu does not mean well for, for Nigeria, and he didn't hide that fact. He was arrogant about it. He went wrong. He said he, he didn't tell anybody what he was going to do for Nigeria. He, he literally lacked what to ask what what was happening. Because one of the things about Nigerians is that Nigerians are very forgiving and Nigerians are very forgetful. If, for example, uh, uh, when Tinubu uh, came into uh, when he was uh, sworn in illegally. And he decided that he was going to just do the right thing for Nigeria. By now, you would have heard Nigerians. And I said, okay, maybe at the end of the day, it was, they won't even care that they, whether I asked the case issue or it doesn't. Because the thing about Nigerians, eh, and that's the thing about this, this Nigerians are in an, in an abusive relationship with, with their rulers. They will do anything to protect and defend their ruler. It's their fellow citizen that they will, if you and I have fake certificate, they will descend on us with everything. But you see those they call that they can make excuses for them. That's why the person that loots billions of Naira, they will say, eh, now is it the only one? Meanwhile, the person that stole uh, 10,000 10, 10, Naira for, they'll be looking for tire and pet petrol to pour on, on, the, on that person. So it should have been quite different. So it's not because of the this whole issue baggage that he came with, that's why things are not working. Things are not working because Tinibu it's not working. Tinibu doesn't have it. He doesn't have the capacity to make it work. He doesn't have the empathy. You must care enough. And that's the part where that empathy is very important. A leader, a leader that is not that doesn't have empathy for the people will not care, will not do anything. That's why it's this because what does he care? Even common statements, he doesn't even bother to make statements when people are being killed. We just had a kitty state. A, a, a boss load of children were taken away. Uh, two, two monarchs were killed. Has the government done anything? Nothing. Within Abuja here, a, 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 a father, his six daughters were taken away. One has been killed. Nothing. Another woman, you know, the killings, another uh, 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 family, their own child were killed. Nothing. So it's not really about all those baggages. Let me give you, let me give you an example of the things. Even when we talk about economy of Nigeria. Oh, yeah, theft. Since after the election, mm. nobody is talking about oil theft anymore. Part of the things that uh, we constantly spoke about. And these thefts are running into billions of naira, billions of dollars every every year. We're losing, I think, how, how many, what, the amount we say we we're losing were like millions of dollars per day. And yet mm -hmm. we're going around to go and borrow money. Meanwhile, our wealth wells are being stolen. Tombolo, who used to be, uh, as, uh, uh, what do they call them, uh, in the Niger Delta? Uh, that were agitating for Niger Delta and all uh, and all of that. Yeah, militant, exactly. Niger Delta militant, who right now, okay, they've been reformed and all of that. He's, he, he protects some of the DC. Has come, he came out publicly to accuse the Nigerian Navy of conniving with the people who were $70 million. They've allowed a lot of these badges uh, to go away. So that test alone, if you stop that, that, that that's something. What about the corruption that is going on in Nigeria right now? We saw the, the three billion naira under the human, uh, Ministry of Humanitarian Services that were that were doled out to less than ten companies. One company was collecting about five uh, five hundred million naira. Another was seven hundred or something a million, four hundred million naira, two fifty. We saw the Minister of Interior, his own company is also part of it, and they just shared this money amongst themselves. Where he's telling us that oh he he's no longer a signatory to the account that he resigned as a director, so you're still the owner of the company. You still have the you're the highest shareholder, and there are only two shareholders: yourself and your wife. And what did they say they were doing? That they paid them consultancy fee to uh to check uh, what's the word they use now on the social register to verify social yeah. register that was done by an APC uh a government. So you see that that corruption is still, uh, is, is still ongoing. Cost of governance itself, they haven't stopped the cost of governance. They're still wasting money. The other day, and there's sure. something like that, Tinibu is always thinking about what will Peter or be do. I'm going to do it. But he doesn't have the character and the competence and the capacity to actually do what Peter or be do. So I'll give you an example. Tinibu comes out to put this thing out to say uh, they're going to cut down the number of people that follow them on, on their trips and to run from president, uh, vice president, even though these ones are illegal, uh, 
you know, the president's first lady, why should there be an office of the first lady that Nigerians are paying for? But that's conversation for another day. And guess what? Mm. The first trip that Tinubu did, he broke that thing. He himself mm. that put out this thing. Nobody asked him to he, he put out. He, because yeah. it's, it's it's not in him. He's just trying to say, okay, what mm. will I do? Oh, dear, uh, Peter, we have done. Let me just share the money. He came out to say that, oh, subsidy has been removed. I, for me, I support a subsidy removal. I've always supported subsidy removal. That was why I was never part of the 2012, uh, you know, uh, protest Occupy Nigeria. But you don't just remove something just like that without putting a lot of things in place. So it's the whole thing is that Tinubu had no business, you know, although Nigerians didn't vote for him, he rigged his way into office. So that, that's just it. Okay, so... Uh Labour Party has a couple of uh, House of Rep members, a couple of senators, and I think one governor, that's Alex Oti. Do you think any of them has been sta a standout person so far in the eight, nine months thereabouts after the swearing in? I would say Alex Oti has stood out uh, in the mm. things that, that, that he has been doing and the way he has been going. Although there's this recent decision that they are going to build... Uh, uh, a multi whatever billion stadium, and I don't see any use for any. It looks like that, just like an uh, white elephant uh, a project. And all, all throughout uh, this morning, throughout today, that's what we've been doing, talking about the whole issue. Some, are, of course, some we always support anything if you like uh, someone. But the other, in terms of the, I, I've not seen any really. They, they haven't been outstanding. And one of the things I always say to people is that Labour Party became popular because Mr. Peter Obi joined. And a lot of people supported because of Mr. Peter Obi. And so it was almost like it was a wave that some people were not able to, to get themselves into office because of that wave that happened. And that's why we always talk about three elections happened on the same day, presidential, senatorial, and uh, what do you call the other one, House of Representatives. Two results could go in the only one was stopped and mm -hmm. you know the results were not uh mm -hmm. uploading so a lot of people got in there so it's not as if this a good number of them it's not as if these were candidates that people had sat down and checked them all the way they got in most people with those tickets a lot of people just got them out of there shouldn't be a vacuum let's just get in there and and, and do this so we, we will have that though there are some of them of course who were and in fairness to labor party i remember labor party were going around asking people to join them I remember, I think even after I talked a lot, I remember talking to a lot of people and I telling them, please come and run. This thing, because people mm -hmm. didn't believe, they didn't see it. I, right from 2020, people, young people were already yearning for a political vote. And let me just tell you something that, let me just digress a little bit. What no happened problem. in 2020, with the 2020 answers was that a generation of Nigerians that had never faced the rot of governor, government, that had never seen the bad side of government actually got it with the massacre that happened at the Lekito Gate. So these are people, young people, like I said, my son is also part of that generation, born in 1999. He doesn't know what it is to have military. So they're always cool. They feel with these old people were always making noise with government. What is government by the way and all of that? 2020, they were on the streets protesting and they saw what government did to them. So from then they became interested in politics. And we're like yearning. So we, we saw that there are people yearning. And so a lot of people didn't run. So to an extent, when people try to say that uh -huh, they voted Labour Party, even the Labour Party lawmakers aren't, aren't different from those other ones. But we're like, yeah, but those were people who got it sort of like accidentally. It's not that people who were pruned, who were checked, or who it was because of their character or whatever that they were, they were voted. So it's left for them to now prove themselves, right? But so far, there hasn't been what is expected of them. By now, you expect them to have a caucus. Nobody is telling you to go riot there or go keep protesting every day. But you should have a stand on issues. And if 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 you're collecting the same money that is being paid to buy vehicles and you're saying that, oh, everybody, there was a difference. There's no difference between you and those people. Why should you be, why should they be giving you this amount of money to buy vehicles when you, people are suffering? Why should you be, and I see one thing they are doing at the National Assembly now, they are busy sharing rice. Your business is not to be sharing rights. Your business is to hold the uh, 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 executive accountable, make laws for us, ratify treaties. You know, when they want to appoint somebody, check and be sure that person is working well. But it's Nigeria where poverty has been weaponized. So they make people so poor that half bag of rice is everything some people are looking for. 
Wow, wow, wow. Yes, Atlanta Discuss. We are still talking to Aisha Yusufu. True to type. She slays stereotype all the time. True to power. Honest. Constant as the Northern Star. Aisha, a lot of people don't know Dati Baba Med like they know Peter Obi, as well as people from the South. Now, mm -hmm. I mean, you know the two of them closely, you work with them closely, and you're always true to power. That's why a lot of us respect you, you know. If Dati Baba Med, does he have the same character, competency, and capability like Peter Obi? Or is Absolutely. he won't better? Absolutely. He, he has the same uh, uh, competence, character, and capacity. And uh, one of the things that I find quite intriguing between the uh, two of them is that they, they sort of like they sort of like match each other. They are mm. a fit. You know, they as human beings, there are certain mm. parts where we are we are we are weak, and then another person is strong on that, and then oh. when we're strong, another person. So it's sort of like uh, a, a oh. fit thing. Uh, so one of the things that people uh, get sometimes they're like, oh, okay, that team, my son, this is Peter of this more like the people's person. He will literally come mm. to this room, he's laughing with everybody, he's this, this, this thing. Uh, that team might not be, it's not, it's not that person who is always, you know, laughing and, and maybe we joke with everyone. He's a bit, and then, you know, so those, sometimes people think that, oh, he's, uh, he's, he's standoffish and all of that, but he, he works with, with, with everyone. And there was a time that I even had to say, I said, look, the same kind of work that P, uh, Peter Obi was putting in, that he was also putting in that work in the northern part of the, of the country, but he was not he was more into the subtle do it with this thing without really amplifying it. It had to go to a time where we're like, no, man, you need to bring this thing. We need to show the, everyone that these things are being done because at the end of the day, perception is everything. And if you're doing this thing without letting people know, it's, like, it's as if you are winking in the dark. So nobody is, is in that. But yeah, they, they are really quite good. And I'll tell you, I think uh, when Dirty was a lawmaker, there was this thing they did, whether something about selling, I, I think there were some properties, either properties or something they were selling, they sold to the national. He refused. So that's character. Mm. He refused to, to mm. because he felt that was wrong. Why are you just, you know, sometimes that's what they do. Uh, so certain things are either forfeited or something. They just sell it to them at giveaway prices. Just just take it. And he refused uh, to, 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 to buy into that. This is someone also, they're both business people. They've, they've both mm. grown wealth. They know what it is to, to work hard and, and, and get uh, uh, and, and get results. And they do that. They're, they're running successful businesses. Uh, that year, I think he has about two or three universities. He has a lot of uh, businesses he's running. The same thing with uh, Peter Obi. And so they were, and these are people who are not hungry. These are They're people not. who don't they have to be in politics for them to survive. The biggest problem we have in Nigeria is that a lot of people who don't have jobs are the ones who are in politics. So politics is their job. And if we want Nigeria to be fit, we need to get people with jobs into politics so that politics is not their major. People must have second jobs. So you are not desperate to continuously be in office or have a, an appointment, or that's why people feel that you, 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 uh, anything that one is doing, that one is looking for an appointment. I'm like, how much are, How much, How much? much do they pay in government? They don't pay nothing, except if you're going to be corrupt and start stealing money. The salary that they pay a minister or a president, I'm looking at it, I'm like, is that where I'll go and be working 24-7 hours for? I, I, no, I can't do that. I, I mean, last year, 20, 2023, I think I, I, barely, I spent like three months in Nigeria. If, I, if, I'm, if I'm a public servant, I can't do that because my time is accountable uh, to the people. It's owned by the people. So why would I for that salary be there? But a lot of people, because that's where they're able to lose money, so that's what keeps them there. But yeah, both of them are really good. Fantastic. So my last question to you, and when you answer this, you can you give us your parting shot. That's a message of hope to Nigerians because Nigerians are very unhappy now. Things are not going well. So my last question to you, do you think the Nigerian diaspora contingent have a role to play in the future of Nigeria? If yes, how? Then you give your message of hope. Okay, absolutely. The, the Nigerians in diaspora have a huge role to be. Not that, not that they have, they're already playing a huge role. And let me start from the economic side. I think Nigerians in diaspora contribute about 3 to 4% of, of, uh, of the GDP. That uh, may, it might yeah. even be more now. With the money, mm. with the money that they send back, the remittances and all of that, with so much political power, they have zero, uh, with so much economic power, economic contribution, they have zero political power, and that's such a shame. And Nigerians, I've always said that 
even before the 2023 election, I said we are going to have two game changers, the Nigerians in diaspora and the youth. And that, we saw that with the 2023 election, the Nigerians in diaspora participated a lot. So we need Nigerians in diaspora. First of all, they need to have their own votes. They need to be able to vote. It doesn't make sense that you are contributing so much to the economy. The economy, people voting any kind of peop uh, uh, people, they ruin the economy and more pressure is put on you to continue to support the people that are back home. Because the kind of uh, uh, things, the kind of requests that Nigerians in diaspora are uh, get, it's amazing because people always hand over the problem that government is supposed to solve. Government doesn't solve it. And they hand it over to those in diaspora because, of course, they know the end uh, currencies that are far higher than, uh, uh, than Nera, than those of us uh, in, in Nigeria. So so that's one. They need to fight, uh, fight for that. And then they also have to, Nigerians in diaspora need to come together and begin to have representation back home. There are people who are retired. There are people either retired, semi-retired, or can work in different places. Well, you can, they can come together and begin to send them to the legislative arm of government. Even if you don't send them to the uh, to the executive arm of government, send them to the legislative arm of government. The whole states that we have in Nigeria have a particular number in the different state houses of assembly and also the National Assembly. So that when you're talking about issues of Nigerians in diaspora, there are representatives that are talking about those issues. We saw a situation, I think some uh, during it was during Ahmed Lawa's time. Yeah, it was that assembly where Nigerians in diaspora had brought in an issue that had to do with pain with. And then the then oh no, it was no, it wasn't at the senior. I think it was the uh, House of uh, Representative. And then the deputy speaker refused to accept it and said that they were not in Nigeria. They were not Nigerian, so they had no business with what was happening in Nigeria. So because they, but you but but you collect their money to the SN, even CBN. Mm -hmm. We tell them that, oh, they should bring this, they will give them certain incentive, but you don't want them to participate in the in the uh, legislative uh, issue of, of Nigeria. But there was a whole lot of uh, backlash on that. They backpelled that on that, and the guy was like, oh, he didn't say that, he didn't mean that. But that alone is an eye-opener for them to begin to look at how can they also get their own people to come and be here. They've, with the 2023 election, they participated in the election also by contributing. One thing that election needs is money. Most times, people who have stolen our wealth, who have looted our country dry, are the ones who continue to perpetrate themselves in office or they are stooges. And people that can serve Nigeria very well, some of them, they've worked for Nigeria before. They didn't steal any. They don't have the money to run for election. So you need those monies that we must put our monies where our votes are. And that's also a part that the Nigerians in diaspora are coming. $1, $10, $1, euro, $10, euro, one pound, ten pound, and so on and so on. It means a lot when you, when you convert it uh, to, to Nigeria. So that participation is also, you know, uh, 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 very, very important. So I would say, yes, uh, Nigerians in diaspora have a, a huge role to play. And right now, I'm sorry to every Nigerian. I have said it before. I consider them as, as the most foolish Nigerians. They work so hard. They work their, their, their fingers off. And then they are busy sending money back home to take care of people who don't vote in the right people who don't do what they're supposed to do, who continue to make excuses for government with all the harsh distance that they do over there. We stay in Nigeria literally all the time we're having holidays. How many holidays do they have uh, over there? So they need to get to a place where there's tough love. If us back home, we are not voting the right people or we are defending people that are working, then let Nigerians in diaspora don't send their money here because if you don't want to have sense, then let's enjoy the suffering. You cannot be doing anyhow on somebody else's bill. Because that's uh, part of the things uh, that, 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 that is happening right now. Uh, on a final note, I'm going to say that no Nigerian is more Nigerian than any Nigerian. This country belongs to every one of us. We must ensure that we stand and fight for Nigeria. For me personally, I always say that I, I fight for the unborn generation the way I wish other people had fought for me. And that no matter what Nigeria throws at me, I'm not going to give up on Nigeria. I'm going to stand here and fight for this country. I ensure that I give a, a better country uh, to, to, our, to our children and our descendants. Nigeria has have everything it takes to be a great country. Prayers will not solve Nigeria's problem. 
because God has given us what we need to be a great country and God will not do for us what he has given us the capacity for us to do for ourselves. So it is time for us to come together. And for those who always look at issue of tribalism, religion, and are more only focused on, oh, they are going to vote for somebody from their religion or their tribe. I always say to them, how do you know you are the tribe that you are? The only reason is because you were told. What if your parents were to come today and say to you, actually, you were abducted and probably that tribe that you hate is really where you are from? What will you then do? So at the end of the day, we have this nation, no matter where we go and no matter where you go, it's still Nigeria. Even if you have a second passport, I always say to people, there's a difference between a British Canadian and a Nigerian Canadian. Because when they see a British Canadian, they know they're in Canada because they want to. But when they see a Nigerian Canadian, they will say you are in Canada because you have to. So if we don't have our mm -hmm. Nigeria working for us, even those that are outside, if Nigeria is not working, it also reflects on you. But when you have a country back home that is, that is working, every one of us can be proud. And we can be proud of that country that we own. I say to people, one, one day, by the grace of God, this country must work in our lifetime. And I want to stay one day and tell my grandchildren of a Nigeria where things didn't work before. And they will look at me and they will say, I'm lying. Because then they will have a great country that every one of them can be proud of. Thank you. Thank you, Aisha Thank you. Yesufu. You have not disappointed our viewers. You've spoken truth to power. You're always as constant as the northern star. Keep up the good work. It Thank will be you. rewarded somehow, some way. Nobody is happy yeah. with Nigeria. At, at the 1960, Nigeria was the beacon of the entire black world. Today, Nigeria is yeah. a disappointment. There's nothing to be diplomatic about. Nigeria is a shock to the system. It's just embarrassing. No national hairline, no national car. Nothing works in Nigeria. All the major indices of a failed state, health, water, security, Nigeria has not has ticked it all. So she's right. Our analysis are right. And she's also very clear that Nigeria has lost a very great opportunity in Peter Obi and Dati ruling them. Well, I don't think that opportunity is totally lost. The, the elections in the future. And where Nigeria is going, who knows? Nobody knows yeah. the future. I always say, we do not have too much time. We need to find a way around it. We need to talk. We need to find a political solution. We can't just be killing people every day like, like rats. It's just totally unacceptable. It is not a way to go. So we're going to call it a wrap there. I promise you I'll bring back Aisha sometime in the future. She's a very busy person. So thank you for your time, Aisha. God bless you. And to all our viewers in the several continent of the world, thank you for your loyalty. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye.